original talk radio station anywhere. We are L.A. Talk Radio at latalkradio.com. You're listening to Fouché Way with Brandon Fouché, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Well, hello, and welcome to the Fouché Way radio show, live every Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m., sponsored by a nonprofit organization called Canine Hope for Improvement Program, where we hope to improve the quality of our dogs' lives by moving towards a no-kill society. The number here is 818-602-4929. Well, here we are, another Thursday. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the seminar that's coming up. Uh, October 4th, and uh, we're going to talk about dog aggression. Uh, it's going to be at Trey Tech College, L.A. Trey Tech College, from 7 to 9 p.m. We want everyone to come down, and let's talk about saving lives. Let's talk about something different, something that is going to keep dogs out of the shelter. I guarantee you we will be talking about things that take place behind the scenes, uh, what we don't know and what we should know in regards to understanding the way dogs think and how we should be communicating with them when we bring them home. I also want to say one other thing before we get started. You know, for those people who are hesitant in adopting shelter dogs, or I've heard people say, look, I'm not going to adopt a shelter dog because they have too many issues. I want you to think about this. Those shelter dogs that we want adopted were not born and raised in the shelter. They were purchased or adopted by people just like you thinking this way from private people or from pet stores or breeders. They got with the human family and became like this. And that's how they ended up in the shelter. It's not the shelter that made them the way they are. It's the people with misinformation. So next time you think about adopting a shelter dog, understand that that very dog was in a home just like you want to get him, but something went wrong. That's the purpose of this radio show, to talk about not just the symptoms of what's wrong, but why things went wrong, so that we don't end up there, so that they don't end up in the shelter, and so that when we are adopting them from the shelter, they don't go back. That's what this is about. And with that, I'm going to bring on the first of our three callers. And my first caller is Gail from Eugene, Oregon. Gail, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Brandon. How are you doing? I'm doing real good, thank you. Okay. How about you? I'm doing just great uh, now that I'm talking to you because, you know, I spoke with you once uh, about the problem with your dog. I think it was a year ago. Is that correct? Right. Right. And the dog's name is Chaya. And yes. Chaya is a shelter dog also. Can you kind of tell us about Chaya and the problems that you've been going through? Sure. Um, Chaya is a um, Border Collie healer mix. She's a very cute little dog. Um, she's about 35 pounds. People think she's a puppy when they see her, but she's actually full grown. Mm -hmm. um, when I met her, I was a volunteer at the shelter, a dog walker, and and had my heart set actually on adopting a pit bull, but Chaya decided that she would adopt me. And so What um, shelter was we, this? What shelter? It was our local county shelter. Okay. Which which unfortunately um was not able to maintain funding and so really doesn't exist anymore. It was taken over by the local humane society, but um yeah, so she had been brought back to the shelter three times before mm. we adopted her. Okay. And I didn't have any information why. They, were, they they didn't have that information apparently or weren't disclosing it. And so um, we were really surprised because she didn't exhibit any aggressive behavior at the shelter. We were really surprised when we brought her home and took her for a walk the first time away from the shelter and she got very um, aggressive and reactive towards other dogs. Was this the first time that you took her for a walk when you brought her home, or was there some time that had passed? The first time. The first time. Okay, tell us about that. Paint that picture for um, us. 
Well, I mean, she she saw a dog across the street some distance away and started lunging and barking and growling and and this and she was basically going ballistic. And this happens anytime she was around another dog or heard one behind a fence barking. I mean, anytime there was another dog around, she got crazy. And she wasn't like that in the shelter. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know what that was, what to do with it, where it came from, but this is what we had. And how long have you been living with this? Two years. Two years. How does that make you feel? Um, completely helpless. Um, completely trapped because we love her. She's wonderful with us. She's wonderful with our cats. She's very affectionate with us. Mm -hmm. Um, But we just feel like we can't take her anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, she actually bit me one time because she couldn't get to a dog. Mm -hmm. Um, We thought maybe it was just a leash thing. Mm -hmm. So I took her to the beach um, after I had her for about three weeks just to see what would happen. I took her to a very quiet beach where there was no one else around, but I knew that another dog might come around. We weren't there 10 minutes. She was playing in the water, saw this other dog like 400 yards away and just charged at it. And the poor dog was on a leash and she just got around it and was barking and lunging at it, going around it in circles until I was able to get there and just throw my body on top of her. Um, She frightened the woman and the dog terribly. So I knew that it wasn't just when she was on leash. Mm -hmm. It was whenever she was around other dogs. Right. And again, this huge mystery to me because I'd seen her in the shelter for more than a week, maybe two weeks before I'd actually adopted her, and she wasn't like that around other dogs in the shelter. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very interesting uh, that you experienced that. Most people don't experience it quite that way, but this goes right into the areas when I talk about how environment can affect the behavior of dogs, how they actually see the environment. And so you're... Two years you've been dealing with that. I mean, you contacted me about a year ago. And first of all, how did you find out about me? Um, I have a friend in L.A. Her name is Maura Nealon, and she told me about you. Okay. So you called me. I remember you had sent me some video, or I asked you to send me some video. And you were telling me, look, we've been dealing with this thing for so long. I need help with my dog. And... You know, I'm listening to your story, and this is this is very interesting, and I want our, our listeners to understand that I have not actually met you, Gail. This has been done over the phone, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, I told you to do some things because I'm doing an evaluation of your dog and of you over the phone, and that's why I ask you questions about where the dog sleeps, how you interact with the dog, how you discipline the dog, how you dominate the dog, how you show them love and affection. The purpose for asking you all of these questions is to tune in, fine-tune in to where I'm going to be working with your dog long distance, okay? To get right. to, to tap into the personality of this dog, how this dog feels about you, its environment, the inside of the house, things like that. And we always want to look at, is this dog mentally dominant and physically submissive? Uh, How old is the dog? What has it gone through? In this case, we don't know. The dog was returned two or three times to the shelter, so we can assume pretty much that it was about the same reason. So I ask you to do some things. And first of all, I want to ask you, the things that I ask you to do, because I'm always talking about discipline and domination, and And until we find a better word, that's the strongest definition that I can use to get people in the mindset that I want them to be in, but not from the concept of the way humans think. And the reason I'm saying this is because I want to ask you over the air the things that I told you to do that are related to those words, discipline and domination. Did you find them horrible things to do? Absolutely not. Okay. That's very important for people to hear because I know a lot of people get turned off when they hear me talk like that. But I'm only talking the way nature intended dogs to process information, to control your dog emotionally, hormonally. Training has been designed to control the dog physically. Sit, stay, calm, heal, down. 
And dogs know already how to do those things, but they do them for different emotional reasons. In other words, if a dog is tired, the beginning of lying down, they will sit. When they are extremely tired, they will lie down. That's a hormonal thing that's taking place. When we ask our dogs to do that, because they are thinking about something else, then we are interfering with the hormone that's in place. Does that make sense to you, Gail? Yeah. I mean, you know, you were asked, we wouldn't ask a child to, well, we do, actually, and it doesn't work, does it, when you, you know, you try to get a, to control a child to lie down when it's not sleepy. It's <laughs> exactly. kind of the same thing. Exactly. That's it, exactly. There's a different hormone that's in place. And so when we're talking about the Fu Shui Wei, we're talking about looking at the dog from the inside out, meaning the way nature intended a dog to process information and the way nature intended a dog to act, and then for the human to look at that and say, oh, that's why you do that. Now, this is what I want you to do. And in order for you to get them to do what you want, you have to understand why they're doing what they're doing. That's what this is about, looking from the inside out and not imposing our will on the dog, but really trying to understand the will of the dog. And so with you controlling Chaya emotionally, you had problems with her at the back fence, I believe, in the yard. And then I think you had problems with her, with people or dogs walking past the front yard. And I gave you some exercises to do, which, let me get into that, because a lot of people say, tell us what to do, tell us what to do over the air, and, and this is important that we have this conversation. If I tell you, and we're not able to sit back, and me not able to understand the components that lead up to why your dog is acting the way it's acting, to know the relationship between you and your dog, all the questions that I ask, if I tell you what to do, you may not get it, or you may not understand why you are to do this or to do that. That's why it's important to have the evaluation. So when I talk to you, do you think I could have just told you right off the bat, or do you think we had a lot of conversations? Do you think it was absolutely necessary for me to talk to you as many times as I did in order for you to understand what to do? Absolutely. I would have, first of all, I wouldn't have had any inkling of why you were trying to direct me the way that you were, mm -hmm. and, I, you know, I would have had no understanding of why I was doing what I was doing, so I don't think it would have been as effective at all. There you go. That's that's what this is all about. And and when I told you what to do, and you actually did it, I mean, how quick was the results? Uh, <laughs> shockingly quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was astonished each and every time. Okay. All the way up until yesterday. I mean, it's just astonished. And that brings us up to yesterday. I mean, I haven't, you haven't walked your dog for one year since I've talked to you, correct? That's right. All right. So yesterday I talked to you and I said, you know, I've been meaning because I want to come there. I would love to do a seminar there. Uh, and I said to you, look, I want to have you on the show because, you know, you're on my mind. And I've, we've been talking a little bit on Facebook, uh, the Fouché Way uh, Facebook. And I said, look, I want to have you on the show. And you're like, well, Brandon, I... I'm still having problems. I haven't walked the dog in a year, right? Right. And I said, look, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do these things and go out and walk this dog. And then you call me back the same day or the next day, and we're going to see if we're going to have you on the show. And what happened? Tell the people. I, I <laughs> try for a walk. Um, and, you know, I have to say that up until yesterday, the reason we didn't take her for walks is because – we were absolutely petrified that we might run into another dog mm -hmm. because it's always it was always a risk that she would get into a you know a state of anxiety and reactiveness and aggressiveness and um, ultimately turn around and bite me again. Um, so I, I just dreaded taking her for a walk. But yesterday I took her out and I was actually looking for other dogs. Um, which was kind of amusing. Um, and after about 15 or 20 minutes, we finally turned a corner and then heard some dogs behind us. And I turned around and walked back towards the dogs, um, feeling fully prepared to be able to um, handle Chaya in a way that would stop her 
mm-hmm. before she got aggressive and reactive, and it absolutely did. I was, I'm still in shock, Brandon, really. <laughs> and you know what's even more uh, shocking? You know, I purposely sent you out on a dog hunt, and you were in that mindset. You know, before you hear dogs barking, you go the other way, right? Now you hear dogs barking and you are drawn like a magnet in the direction (laughs) of that dog. How did that feel? Because that's what people need to know. When I tell you to go hunting for a dog so that you can do these things, I mean, you have to get yourself in a certain mind frame, you know, different from the way you were thinking. So you had to come out of that fear stage. I felt confident. I felt empowered. Mm -hmm. Um. It was very liberating, you know, to not feel afraid and intimidated and, oh, my God, what's going to happen if we run into a dog? I mean, it was wonderful. And Chaya, what was the expression? I mean, what do you think she was thinking? Because I'm always talking about tapping into the dog emotionally to bring them into a submissive state of mind where you can assume the position of leadership. Do you feel that she was in that state of mind? Yeah, I, don't, I just think she thought, oh, well, I better not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to come along with you, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to go there and do that. That's how she, that's how she seemed. And that's, that's what she was thinking. I mean, you know, when a dog is in the shelter, they are in a different world. That is a different world. When your dog is adopted from the shelter and you bring them into your home, that becomes a different world. Why is that a different world? Because the people in the shelter act a certain way. They got jobs to do, things to do. They're all about business. When you bring a dog and bring them into your home, you are in control of what goes on on that side of the door. And you feel that way, right? Don't you feel empowered in your own home? Yes, absolutely. This is an energy that you ooze out of yourself without even thinking. The dog believes that you believe that you own this property, the inside. But when we step outside, we don't own that. We don't feel that we own that. We feel that we are at risk to whatever takes place in that environment. And when aggression takes place, either your dog being aggressive or another dog being aggressive, especially when it's another dog, we feel powerless. And so our dog sucks that energy up like a sponge. You have to believe this because we must understand dogs can sense and smell if you have cancer. Isn't that amazing? Do you think that they would not be able to know that you feel insecure? In a, in a, oh, no. They know. No, no. He knows. Exactly. And so even though we're talking about dogs, we're talking about working with dogs, I am really talking about working with people. I'm talking about changing your way you think. I'm asking you to step back, turn around, and look at this thing from a different perspective to get you in the place that you need to be first so that you can tell the dog how to think about this information. Because the dog is really saying, this is what every dog is saying, how do I address the needs of this situation, right? Am I addressing the needs of this situation from the way I think or the way my leader wants me to think about this? And if you are allowing them to think the way they want to, then these are the problems that cause people to come on the show and now you have begun yesterday after one year to begin to think this way and how does that make you feel like I said I mean fabulous empowered um, in control and, not trapped you know it's, exactly. just, it's just so liberating I yeah because you're living I'm, in you're just like living in you're in jail with your dog I was I can't we couldn't go anywhere couldn't take her anywhere, couldn't take her, you know, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't fantasize, you know, that I'll have a dog that I can take to a dog park. I just want a dog that I can walk down the street. Yes. And I couldn't do that. Yeah, that's, you know, there's a lot of people out there like that. And, and this is the reason that dogs end up going back to the shelter, because we haven't been taught 
how to think in this way. It's not about the doing. What do I do, Brandon? Show me what to do. Yeah, that's part of it. But how do I think? How do I accept and understand where to begin? Why is my dog doing this? And then we got to go home with that. We have to go back home and say, this is why your dog is doing it. It's about the relationship that you have with your dog. Just like the relationship you have with your significant other. The same thing. you got to get it right. And so after one year, I'm glad I spoke with you again and that you were able to do this. And this is just the beginning. Because just like you said, I don't expect to have this or expect to have that. Just wait to see what you're going to have. And, and when I decide or able to come out, I'm going to show you some other things. You know? I can't wait, Brandon. I just can't wait. Well, I can't wait to come out also and meet Chaya. But I wanted to have you on. I'm glad that you were able to do that. And I want to thank you. And I'm sure that our listeners are thanking you because there is someone out there that are having that same problem. And, you know, sometimes I'll have a guy on that will say that. And a listener would say, yeah, but that's a guy. You know, when you have a woman that's having this problem with a dog, it's not a little bitty dog, and, and there's another w- women out there that have these big dogs, they need to hear that it can be done. So I want to thank you. No, thank you, Brandon. I mean, uh, you know, you've changed our lives, and I, I can't thank you enough. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, and, and thanks for following the Fouché way, Gail, and we will talk soon, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Brandon. Bye-bye. Uh, our next caller is David, David Lou. David has a dog named Blake. David, are you there? I'm here. Hi, hey, Brandon. Uh, pretty good, man. Uh, you know, I really like your dog in that I love the energy. A lot of people, huh, they don't like that kind of energy. I mean, they like it when they're doing the love and affection. But a dog that has that kind of energy Man, I mean, you know, that's what I deal with all the time. But I want you to tell our listeners, first of all, where Blake came from, how you ended up adopting her, and what was, what's was what been going on since then. Um, okay. I, uh, we, uh, me and my girlfriend, we found Blake at the West Hollywood Animal Shelter. Okay. Um, uh, that's where we basically, uh, you know, we went in. When we when we got there, she was uh she was kind of she was kind of calm in in her kennel, mm-hmm. and then when we brought her out, she she was a little jumpy. But everyone kept telling us it was because she had been in the kennel all day. But after we took her home, <laughs> uh, we kind of realized that she was kind of always that energetic. <laughs> exactly. Um, and she, she is a really sweet dog. Like uh, you know, I, I uh, I'm in love with the dog. But when we take her out and she sees other dogs, uh, she immediately uh, gets gets jumpy and then starts pulling towards them. Um, she starts, she starts lunging. Sometimes she'll, she'll growl and bark. But even when I, usually when I meet other owners, usually I only go towards if it's a, if it's a bigger dog, someone of the same size. She's mm-hmm. a, well, they told us at the pound she was a half lab, half uh, pit bull mix. Mm-hmm. Pretty much only medium sized dogs. They usually just say she just wants to play. Uh, but if I let them, it's usually, yeah, the dog usually leave after you know just a couple of seconds. Or she just starts to walk from her um, because she she kind of starts jumping over him. She doesn't really know how to say hi. Mm-hmm. And uh, tell us about how you got bit. You got bit once, right? Oh yeah. Um, it was the first the first week uh, we got her. I was taking her out for uh, a walk at night, and then there was a dog um, that was fairly close. That kind of uh, like we ran at a corner, and I no none of us saw the dog coming. And so uh, she started lunging, and I started pulling her back. Uh, mm-hmm. But I was hel- I was holding her back by the leash, and she kind of got on her hind legs. Mm-hmm. Um, but when she couldn't get to the dog after a few seconds, she just kind of turned around, and then she didn't bite that draw blood. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she, she definitely tried to bite me, and I, she she kind of really really quick just just kind of snapped in my arm. Mm-hmm. And then when I got her off, she kind of started pulling towards going after my ankles. Um, and I was, I was kind of, I was kind of at that moment that, that, that I kind of had a, an aggressive or violent dog. Um, <laughs> but I mean, even though she does that, she's kind of easy to stop after she does, she gets like that, but it's kind of a, I guess, I guess troubling to, to know when she gets in that state, you never really know what she's going to do. Okay. And now did this happen to just you or, or your girlfriend? Oh yeah. Just, just me. Okay. 
And so does she, does she walk her after you told her that? Oh, she um she did. Okay. The, good. Well, after I came home and told her about it, we kind of we kind of talked about it like, oh, is she, is she too much to handle? Mm-hmm. But I mean, we we kind of thought about it and we're like we're kind of committed to it. like we didn't you know it wasn't like a test test run that we brought her home. Okay, so you still had we hope. Just felt like, Exactly, exactly. All right, so that's good because a lot of that would have sent that dog back to the shelter. So from there you decided, hey, look, I better get some help with this dog. And so you uh, started going to some training classes, is that correct? Oh, exactly, yeah. Um, the shelter center of trainer, and then there's also a, a free dog socialization agility class mm-hmm. in downtown Los Angeles that we're going to. Oh, okay. Um, but we felt like... Uh, uh, they were helping. They were giving us options on how we should deal with the problem, but it, I felt like it wasn't helping us find a way to socialize, like to have her actively be around other dogs without, you know, without some metal or throwing her away the whole time. Okay, and so let me ask you: Would going to to the trainer that they had sent you to and in, in the training classes mm-hmm. that you were going to? I mean, how effective was it for you? Um, the the, the methods were definitely definitely helped okay but it was just uh like most of them were rewards based where like you know if she's a a dog they were a treat maker which she would do um and probably more than half the time she would listen you know if you caught her before she got too excited but if like the like around like the same kind of situation if you rounded a corner there was a dog or you know all of a sudden there's dogs on both sides of the street you have nowhere to go Mm -hmm. um then it's it got really hard to get her attention, to get her to calm down. You know, even if he had hot dogs or steaks in your pocket, <laughs> like she, if she wanted to, if she wanted to go at that point, you're kind of helpless. Yeah, you know, David. Really, what these things are designed for is to increase the relationship between you and your dog. It, it seals more mm-hmm. of the bond when you're giving treats. You know, it, it is positive reinforcement, but the message that the dog is getting from it is that you are being positively you know, loving to the dog, okay? And so they're not associating it actually with the stimulant. That's why at times they don't care about the treat, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's usually what happens when it's food uh, rewarding. All right, so so then you you came to me. Someone referred you to me. Um, we... Uh uh, at the at the shelter, um, there was a the, the, the woman who helped us. And her name was Deb. Mm. Um, my girlfriend had been texting her the whole time, and basically mentioned that she that, that time that she got aggressive, how she pulls towards other dogs. Sometimes it's it's a little hard to handle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then she just suggested that we contact you either over the phone um, or bring her in to see you. And that's and that's I you know I went to your website and then a few messages. Uh, and yeah, that's basically how I got in contact with you. Okay. All right. So now, you know, here is where a dog can really get uh, misdiagnosed. I want to say this to you and our listeners. The reactivity of the dog's nervous system has to be considered when we are trying to introduce dogs together. Some dogs, the reactivity of their nervous system is so high that they cannot meet other dogs when they're on leash because of the stress that the leash creates, the confinement, the restriction. Okay? Uh, David, can you hear me? I hear a lot of noise in the background. Oh, uh, oh yeah, I, I can hear you. Okay. This, Sorry, Mom. All right. And so when you try to do this in a training fashion on the leash, on the collar, uh, you are creating more energy and and that's too advanced some of the training classes are too advanced and I know that sounds weird how could a beginner's training course be too advanced well it's beginning a beginning training course because the human thinks that it's a beginning training course but to the dog they don't understand what's happening and so it creates stress And I've said it a million times that stress can lead to aggression. And that's how you got bit. So with this dog, we have to first give it something that nature intended for it to have 
in the way that nature says, without the fear of the human being interfering within the moment. And I know this is easily said than done, but it is a formula. And so when you brought the dog to me, how did you feel when you came back to pick her up? Um, I felt really good. Uh, when, I, well, when I first came in, I didn't really know. When I came in to pick her up, I didn't really know what to expect. But mm-hmm. after looking at the videos um, and seeing her uh, <laughs> being being friendly mm-hmm. and at least allowing uh, some of the, uh, actually most of your dogs to dominate her, I was I was kind of relieved that she wasn't um, that she wasn't just strictly like an aggressive or, or she didn't just turn on other dogs that, like on site. Right. Um, it was actually it was like a. a it was really happy to, for me to see to see her interact uh, with other dogs normally. Even though I, uh, in the videos you can still ha- tell she's really high energy. She just wanted to jump over everybody. Yeah. Um, on there's two occasions after I took her home um, that I was walking down the street, and one time it was an off leash dog that just ran up to us. Right. Uh, and she and b- before it happened before, uh, but I usually pulled her away right before. Right. Um, but she would get kind of, you know, jumpy, barking, aggressive, start pulling towards them. Yes. She let the, the dog that ran up on us, uh, you know, like go up her slowly and sniff her, mm-hmm. uh, which I was kind of, I was kind of amazed that she, that she, she picked it up. Mm-hmm. But after the, the owner then ran out and grabbed the dog by the leash and, and said, sorry, and as he was pulling her away, then she started getting jumpy and, you know, barking and getting on her hind legs. I was just happy, but I was happy to, you know, she was <laughs> she was letting other dogs greet her. It happened a second time, uh, just last night. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, it was the the other owner suggested. He, he said uh, she looks like she just wants to play, so we let her kind of go at it. And she she let the dog, you know, kind of slowly move in, sniff her, uh, and then she and then she started, you know, kind of kind of jumping on the other dog, and then the other dog just walked away. Right. Which is what I mentioned the first time, but it was maybe she was too high, high, high energy for some dogs. But I definitely think the um, letting her be natural around other dogs, um, just like you said, is, uh, is definitely uh, uh, helping her. Right. Well, see, my place, it, you know, it's like a controlled environment. There are experiments mm-hmm. that go on all the time with socialization. You know, the key is not advanced training, but advanced socialization. And... In that first situation that you mentioned to us, when the dog ran up and she allowed the dog to sniff her, I mean, that's something that I teach at my place, to stand still and let it happen, right? And then what happens is there is a certain amount of time that must go by during the sniffing phase because there are certain areas to sniff. It's like reading a book from start to the finish. And then what happens is the dogs kind of walk away or they begin to interact with each other. If the human interferes at that moment, meaning interfering within the moment because of our insecurities, because of our fears or whatever that is, and we pull back, then at that moment we create the energy and that's when the dogs, you know, explode. Because they weren't done. Do you understand? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So they have to play that out. Now this is a this is something that has to go over and over again until the dog really gets it. And I want to mm-hmm. definitely keep working with you uh, with her. There is another video that I want to show, and we definitely we talked about using your video for the seminar because your dog, because of the reactivity of the the energy or the nervous system, you will see the dogs that I have there that are going to discipline and dominate your dog into submission to control that energy and to reduce the hormones so that the dog can become calm. Now, I've showed you part of that. You remember seeing it at my place. But I want you to remember, and I want the the listeners to understand, this is going to happen when you see this, the dog that's doing it, they are acting dominant and aggressive in terms of their verbalizing, the growling and the pinning and things like that. And people were going to think, oh, my gosh, this is this is terrible. But there's no fighting going on. There's just mental and physical domination. Do you remember seeing that, David? Oh, I do. Yeah, exactly. Now, how did that make you feel when you first saw that as an owner, your, that happening to your dog? Um, it, 
uh, it was kind of, uh, I was kind of nervous uh-huh. when I first saw it happen because I didn't know how she was going to react. Right. Um, um, but the, I mean, that's, that's how I treat her on the walk too. Like when, when we were around other dogs, we get nervous. But when I saw that, uh, she, w- she would either, um, meet the same, the same type of, uh, dominant, uh, dominance that the other dog mm-hmm. was, was trying to pass, uh, uh, put on her mm-hmm. or she would, um, basically, uh, you know, stay, uh, get low to the ground and let the other dog dominate her. I realized that, that it was a, kind of a natural thing for Right. And a natural thing for them to go through. And so when, when they you meet other dogs, right. see, so, so when you saw that happening, even though you felt nervous, did you see how that was absolutely necessary to for that discipline and domination to take place? Oh, of course. Because yeah, you know, most people don't get a chance to see that because what they end up seeing is the fight. <laughs> you know, because it's just done. Mm-hmm. And it's done in a way that it's too much. The dog misinterprets what's happening. Boom, because they never learned how to receive this type of discipline and domination. And and that's what we're going to talk about in the seminar. We're going to show this this video that some people may think it's hard and difficult to take, but you're I want to explain that to you. You know, we want to explain what's happening in real time, you know, behind the scenes and what's going on in the dog's mind. It's going to be really powerful to understand so that we can change the way people think when dogs interact and not just think that they should be more domesticated and act more like humans we've got to get into the mind of the dog and so i'm glad david that you were able to come to me and uh, and bring blake and we're going to continue with blake uh and i'm going to get you in that dog park okay that's great news. <laughs> all right man so we uh are going to be happy to see you at the seminar and show that video, and we'll see you October 4th. But I, I think I'll see you before then with Blake, okay? Oh, exactly, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, David, for sharing your story with our listeners, and we will talk to you later, okay? okay. Thanks, Ben. Bye-bye. Well, our next caller I'm happy to talk to uh, because I've seen a couple of times, and her name is Victoria. Victoria has a dog named JoJo. Victoria, are you there? I am. Hi, Brandon. How you doing? <laughs> Good. You know, um, it's it's a pleasure talking to you too because although JoJo has the energy in your personality, you've got energy too. Oh, I you do know? definitely. Right. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, you kind of uh, match the energy of your dog. But yeah. the difference there is that even though you both have the same energy, the communication between the two of you was not quite right. The relationship yep. was not quite right. And your story is very interesting uh, because you get a chance to see in life, real time, how the environment affects this dog. Because, first of all, when you came to me, uh, let's tell the people how you felt when you saw the videos of JoJo with other dogs. Yeah, well, she's such kind of an anomaly because we know that she's great with our dog or other dog that we have. They play and they're great. And at her foster homes before we adopted her, she was great with those dogs. So we knew that it was possible. So to see her playing, it was like, yes, I knew I knew this could happen, you know, but we hadn't been able to introduce her to anybody else besides our dog and any kind of social thing. Mm-hmm. So. And and that was that's crazy, you know, because yeah, it's like exactly. you're telling everybody, oh, she's a wonderful dog, blah blah blah, right? right? Like sure. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, she has this explosive energy. Yep. You know that people will try and take that energy and say, you know what, she's got so much energy, I'm going to enroll her in an agility course, or right. I'm going to put her on a bicycle. Or I'm going to go jogging with her, right? And yep. I'm going to do something physical with her because a physically tired dog is a mentally happy dog. Have you heard right. that before? Right, that's what you hear all the time. Right. Wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like, let's take for you, let's take you for an example. You look like yeah. maybe you're a runner, okay? Yeah. If you run every day, you're going to get better. Right. right? So when you're doing this with your dog, you're actually making a better athlete. 
Mm-hmm. So that means if you run 40 minutes a day, because I have clients that say, you know, man, Brandon, I've run 40 minutes a day. I come back, my dog still has a lot of energy. Man. Right, because your level is, you know, they're getting in shape. They're getting in shape. <laughs> 40 minutes gets easier. <laughs> exactly. And so we've been taught uh, in society that exercise is the key, and it's the first thing to do with your dog. And Mm -hmm. I have found that that's not true. Exercise is very overrated. You know, dogs are learning whether we're teaching them or not. So we have to be careful what it is that we are putting in their minds. If we communicate with our dogs through physical things, running, jogging, jumping, agility, things like that, then they will acclimate to that. And dogs are built to be physical because the physical aspect was related to hunting and being able to bring down game to eat. So it was necessary to be in that kind of shape. But because their food comes in a can, it comes in a bag, the exercising that we do, the physical part, is actually producing something that is going to make our life horrible. (laughs) Right? And I think you were finding that out. Yeah. You know, um, mental energy is more draining than physical energy. We have only to look at ourselves. When we're mentally tired, we're physically tired. If you're physically tired, if you work out, you can wake up in the morning and do something else that's physical, you know? Yeah. This is about what's happening in the dog's mind, how they perceive their world, their environment, what you do with them, they will create a reality out of that. And with JoJo... Uh, I gave you some things to do in the beginning, and you said they work fine a day or two. Yeah. And then they started to lose, right, the power. Exactly. Exactly. Then all of a sudden it was like, uh-oh, each, each walk was getting worse and worse. Yeah. And, exactly. And now the couple of things have taken place. I've only talked to you. I've never talked to your husband. Right. I haven't really been uh, in your home to see how things are laid out and the things that you do with them. So Mm -hmm. when I hear things like that, then what it tells me from understanding how dogs think, some dogs are mentally dominant and physically submissive, and some dogs are physically dominant and mentally submissive, okay? And -hmm. some dogs can be mentally dominant and physically dominant. And so when something doesn't work, then I start looking in other areas. And so I determine that she was mentally and physically dominant. And so there's Mm -hmm. a different way that we have to deal with her. And so when I came over with that information and showed you what to do, tell our listeners what happened. Oh, it's it's night and day. I mean, the thing that's so amazing is that it's effective immediately. You know, Mm -hmm. so much training you hear, oh, it's going to take time, it's going to take time, it's going to take time. It's not, nothing takes time. It's just a matter of figuring out what you're doing and why you're doing it. The results were instant. So her problem was very similar to your first caller to Gail with, you know, leash aggression, um, just horrible on the leash, non-responsive, pulling in general, and then other dogs, if she'd see another dog, hear another dog. It, she'd lunge and bark and whine and go crazy. So um, with with what we did, it was just she would follow behind me and nothing would face her. Right. And, you know, when we try Not to... Not interested in anything else. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you try to handle that physically, I mean, your husband's a big guy, right? Right. He's 6'2", like 210 pounds. Oh, you know, exactly. I'm, I'm tiny, but, but she was just as bad with him as with me. And it, we, both of us would, would come home when we'd walk her, you know, either, either one of us drenched in sweat just from <laughs> all the work. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, this is, let's look at this thing. You know, leaders, alphas, control the pack Mm -hmm. mentally. As humans, we try to control our dogs physically. Yeah. Okay? And that's why you come back sweaty, because you're trying to hold the dog back. You know, it's like when you grab the leash and you pull backwards, it tells the dog to pull forward because they're pulling against pressure. Yep. Okay, so you're actually saying pull, but no, mm-hmm. I don't really mean that. So I'll pull back, and then the dog starts to pull, and you know, becomes this whole thing. It's almost like saying, I'm I'm on a horse, and I want the horse to stop, so I squeeze him, right? Right. <laughs> but that does the opposite. Backwards. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And so this is our thinking with our dogs for so many years has been backwards. And then people will ask me, well, Brandon, how come it works with this dog? 
and and how come it's not working with my dog? Because there's a lot of factors involved. Um, first of all, in a pack, there are alphas, betas, subordinates, and ruts, and they all have a specific purpose within that pack. That's the mm-hmm. number one thing. If they are a leader, then they're going to look at their environment differently. Just depends on what has happened to them. The baggage. I like to say the baggage. You know, yeah. and, I, and I say, what's wrong with saying baggage? I mean, every dog has baggage. Every person has baggage. Absolutely. You know? Right. So in this case, she had this baggage. And, and what was the baggage? What was the do- downfall on her side? The reactivity of her nervous system made people afraid. She approached things too quickly. You know, they didn't know yeah. whether it was going to be something nice or something wrong. We always look and depend on our dogs to tell us how we're going to feel about a situation. Isn't that interesting that we own the dog, the dog belongs to us, and we look to the dog to say, are you going to make me feel comfortable (laughs) with this situation? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, and and that weakness at that point, the dog sees it, and they they feel it, and they say, you know what, I'm going to take control of this situation. And that's what happens. Now... Yours is a very interesting case, and it's interesting because of this. When you're walking in your environment, and this is something that most people never know, in your environment, you are sending out signals to other dogs that you are there. When your dog has a dog tag on, and it begins to jingle and and hit against the clip, The other dogs in the neighborhood hears that. And what are they saying? It's saying, you're coming. You're coming through my territory. And then they start barking aggressively at your dog. And then your dog becomes aggressive towards them, becomes anxious, excited. Have you seen that? Absolutely, that's what happens. And we have a lot of dogs in our neighborhood, so it's just this cycle. You know, they know that we're coming, and she knows what houses we're coming up on, where the dogs are going to be before anybody starts barking, and then out they come, charging the fences, and then she charges back, and yeah. Yeah, so what I'm saying is you are creating an environment that is becoming that dog's reality. Yeah. But we don't think like that. That's what you're saying to your environment, to those dogs, with the tags jingling. Yeah, here we are. Here we are. Come get us. (laughs) And then you're wondering, why is my dog acting like this? Why should my dog care about what this dog is doing behind the fence? At that point, you're not being realistic. you got to tape those tags up so they don't make that noise. You are turning your dog into prey, walking in a neighborhood, where your dog doesn't feel like prey. It feels like a predator. That's why you've got this conflicting thing happening. Mm-hmm. You've got to tape those tags up so that you're not saying, here I come. And, and you know, there's many people that are listening, and, and we know when those tags jingle, I don't care where you are, where there's other dogs, they, they are alerted to that noise. They know that means dog. Yeah. And we taught them that. But th- that doesn't mean dog. That just means a person put a tag on a collar that's jingling and that we are genetically connecting to the sound and the environments that the dogs are naturally attracted to, and now all of a sudden that means dog. Mm -hmm. So you may even pick up your keys and they jingle and the dog, they start barking because they've been taught this. That's what I mean by learned behaviors. Inadvertently, we don't even know that we're teaching them that. You are showing the environment that your dog is prey, and because the dogs are barking at, at your dog, Jojo, Jojo sees the environment as prey, okay? Mm-hmm. And so she acts accordingly. So what I want the listeners to know is that you have to take back that power by not just doing but understanding why you need to do it. There are a lot of people that want to know what to do, what to do, what to do. And I want to ask you on the air with everybody listening, do you think if I just showed you that it would have been good enough or did you have to understand every single thing like what I'm talking about now? 
Oh, I think the understanding is absolutely crucial because otherwise, it, you know, if you don't understand why you're doing it, you're more likely to do it wrong, right? Because and, and you're more likely to make a mistake or inadvertently do something else because you're not understanding what the whole point is and, and why your dog's acting this way and why you're responding the way you are. So, yeah, you completely have to understand. Yeah. I, I was telling my husband, you know, everything that you, you've said to me, and the psychology is so fascinating and it makes so much sense. Because we as people, well, it affects us this way too, you know? Mm-hmm. For example, you gave the analogy in our neighborhood of, um, and I was walking around the neighborhood and, and everybody starts yelling and screaming at me, get off the sidewalk, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> <laughs> How would I react to that? Um, and if there was never any physical consequences, and eventually I'd start yelling back, right? Yep. I can walk here, wait for me. So that's happening with a dog and you're like oh that makes perfect sense <laughs> you would never think of it that way <laughs> exactly so now you're thinking from the inside out you're saying this is what my how my dog is seeing the environment so i know yep. that i have to be mindful of those things and step in front of that and control it and that's why things exactly. are so instant when you're dealing it and you're controlling her mentally now did you see that Oh, completely. You see it initially in just the body language, because that's what I told you. When we took her to your place, you know, the ears are relaxed, the tail is tucked, and, you know, her body language is very submissive. Mm-hmm. And when we'd walk her here, it's like always on alert, you know, tail straight out, ears straight up, uh, so right away. And right. When, when you're doing things properly here, it's the same thing. All of a sudden, she goes into that submissive body language, and you can see that mentally, she's, she's completely in a different place. Exactly. You're, cre- you're controlling the environment. You, our dogs must see their environment as a predator to keep them in a prey mentality. That's a submissive posture, okay? Yeah. And we are the ones, we are the alphas, we are the leaders that are going to take the hit if something goes wrong. Our dog needs to know that. They're not protecting us, okay? And yep. and that's mm-hmm. the difference here. So we still got some things to do with JoJo. We got to get you out and get you in the park and and get you doing the things that you need to do. And, of course, I want you also to be at the seminar. Uh, I want yeah. everyone to meet so that you can network and talk about this thing because if we come together like a family and everybody's doing the same thing, when you see each other on the street, you're going to know what you're doing the Fouché way, and you're going to help each other. But right now, everyone's separate. Training is separate. Oh, I got my dog. He's nice. Your dog is bad. Stay away from me. We want to get away from that. That's not going to help no kill. What's going to make this no kill work is that as a family, the human family and the pack of the dogs, the family there, come together, and that's the way that we're going to save dogs' lives. And so I'm really happy that you were able to come on, Victoria, and talk to to everyone about JoJo, another shelter dog. My pleasure. And, again, Thursday, October 4th, L.A. Trade Tech College from 7 to 9 p.m. We will have a seminar. We will talk about dog aggression. We will attempt to save lives. We will save lives. Uh, Today, I believe that we have saved a life, and we want to continue. So thank you very much, Victoria, David, and Gail. And we will be back with the Fouché Way radio show next week. Thank you. Listening to the Fouché Way with Brandon Fouché, right here on LA Talk Radio.